Are there any later writings that could be considered the inspired word of God uh, after the apostles finished their writings? So later on in the second and third centuries. I think the early church was uh, very limited to just the apostles in the writings as far as scripture goes. I think, again, once the apostle John died in 100 AD, 101 AD, uh, that was kind of the cutoff, I would say, that they understood as far as scripture goes. There were later writings. The early church fathers have a lot of writings, but their writings all point back to the gospels. Uh, the early church fathers, uh, the period from uh, the time of Christ and his disciples, uh, their disciples afterwards, uh, they contain over a million quotations of scripture in their writings. We can pull a million different quotes of scripture. So it's clear that whenever they're writing, they don't see themselves as writing anything inspired. They're all pointing back to the documents that are the, the New Testament. And so I don't think uh, as far as anything that meets all the standards, the criteria for canon, nothing comes along after the Gospels because there's no one that has that firsthand uh, witness to Jesus' life or even a close uh, encounter with someone who did to uh, meet that qualification for a scripture. So I'd say the cutoff would be after the apostles died uh, in 100 AD. I would add something really controversial and make none of you all come back. <laughs> I believe in a theoretically open canon. See, we talk about the canon being closed. I don't think the canon's closed. I mean, wh whoever said it was closed? Bible never said it was closed. I don't believe in any church council that has the authority to close it. I just believe that it's never going to be opened again. But it's theoretically open. What do I mean by that? Well, when, whenever, I look at, whenever I look at the canon, I see marks of authenticity based upon who it is that wrote them and based upon their ability to demonstrate their access to God, you know, through raising the dead or through miracles or through seeing Christ in the Old Testament, through doing just extraordinary things and being in a context and a culture in which they would, they would be able to approve or disapprove these things. How did, how did the Ten Commandments get in the canon? I mean, those got in the canon, right? Well, whenever Moses came down from the mountain and everybody saw what they saw, they probably didn't say, all right, let's have a council and let's see if these meet the test of uh, criteria for authenticity. Now, these are very legitimate tests, but at the same time, it's just, hey, we know who they came from. We know the miracle just happened on this mountain. Therefore, they automatically were in the canon. It was a very organic thing. The canon at the beginning was organic. Why, when did they start accepting it? When, when did they accept it whenever Paul gave them a letter? Right whenever Paul gave them a letter because it's in the context of what Paul did and how awesome he was and how they knew he had a connection to God. So they didn't meet and say, should we accept this or whatever else. Later, church had to go through this once the controversy started. But was, say somebody comes today. Say if you're a futurist, you believe these things are future. With regard to at least Revelation chapter 4 through 19, you think the, the beast, false prophet, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the two prophets that come, uh, all mentioned in Revelation, is yet future? If you believe that, which I do, if you believe that, then you believe that there's at least two prophets coming on behalf of God. If they wrote something down and said this needs to be belong, belong in a new canon or just a little appendage to the canon, uh, it wouldn't be long that it would last, but I'd put it in there. You know, I mean, it's because it is uh, something that is demonstrated to be on behalf of God. So I believe in a theoretically open canon. Anybody in history, I, I say, you know, about the Pope who is supposed to be kind of the new authority, the living authority, that carries on the authority of the apostles in order to keep the church straight and, and, and doctrinally solid, which I'm all for, but the Pope has to demonstrate the authority and the signs of a true apostle. According to uh, 1 Corinthians 12.12, 12, the signs of a true apostle were demonstrated among you, Paul says. Just nobody has. It's a high criteria to meet. The canon is not something anybody can write and say, hey, Let's, let's propose this. I say, okay, what's the context in which you're proposing it? Who wrote it? And tell me about him. What's, well, what can I see as far as his miracles? I mean, we've got the internet today. We can all look at it. So 
it, it, it's theoretically open, but it's actually closed because nobody's going to meet those criteria. That criteria. <laughs> the Mormons. How do I relate this to the Mormons since they do have an open canon, or or they do have added books in the canon? This question does always come up whenever I bring this, and so it's a very good question. I would say that uh, Joseph Smith's private encounter with with the angel and the writing of the tablets does not meet the criteria. I could say I had a private encounter. Anybody could say that I had a private encounter with God and, and uh, write something down. But that's purely subjective. It's, it's what we call non-falsifiable. I can't falsify your statement. One of you said I had a dream last night and God came to me and told me to write this book. I can't falsify that. And that's not the way God works. Around his, his people, around his prophets, they're doing extraordinary things that the entire community cannot deny. So if he did do that, and you saw that, and, it, and he was in accordance with previously revealed revelation, both through Deuteronomy 18, Deuteronomy 13 are key here. Deuteronomy 18 says that they, that they must perform some type of sign or wonder in order to be a true prophet, and Deuteronomy 13 says that they have to um, abide by previously revealed material. So somebody can't, can't come in and say the word was not really made flesh and do a miracle. They may be able to. Even Deuteronomy 13 says, I'm, there may be a prophet that comes among you who performs a great sign or a great miracle, like maybe the uh, magicians did uh, with Moses. They seem to do the same things he was doing. But they teach something different and say, let's go follow after other gods. The Lord your God is doing this to test you. So he may even bring in people who do miracles, but they do a miracle and then they say, Jesus was not incarnate or, or salvation is not by faith. So 